have we might have a few late strivers. I don't know, but we've got to get started. In fact, we have to pray today that the Lord stops the clock because I really do want to get to the end of this lesson. We've done the first half. I've got to get through the second. The second is more packed in a way than the first. So. Anyways, let's just go ahead. We're going to pray really quickly, and then we're going to delve right in. Again, let me remind you, your questions are more important than me getting through. So, so interrupt me if you have any questions, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you thanking you, praising your name. Lord, thank you for this home that we can gather together, that we can start this middle of the week by eating your word. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place right now. Would you teach us? Would you guide us? Would you rearrange our thinking so that it aligns with the word of God, the truth? Lord, we thank you. And Lord, may we be empowered, Father, as we walk out of here in your strength to be a light in a very dark world. Thank you for it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. We're doing the character of God. We're studying the characters before we begin with the story. And we're looking at God. And we decided we would do this A through Z. Not that that covers all of God. It's just a good, broad understanding of his whole character, both sides of the coin. So we did A through M last week. We'll do N through Z today. So we're starting with letter N, which stands for name. Is a name more than a label? Yes, a name distinguishes someone from anyone else. But actually, our name tells us more about our parents than it does ourselves. Many people want a name change, right? And in that, what they're saying is, I want to be me, not what my parents want me to be. Naturally, we want to express what and who we feel we are. And that's why nicknames often come a little closer and tend to be more accurate in matching our personality and characteristics. Um, they have meaning because nicknames are often given to us by our peers after they get to know us. And so it really matches our personality. But even with nicknames, they are, too, more than just labels. A name means that I can get in touch with someone. So that means in order to know God's name, I can get in touch with him. Okay? But God... G-O-D, or in Hebrew, it is L, E-L. It's not God's name, okay? God, we talked about that last week. It's a supernatural person, one who does not need to be made. That is the de description or the definition of God. Therefore, God is more of a description, like an adjective. The word God signifies power, obviously, one that does not need to be made. That would signify power. And so in Hebrew, God, or El, E-L, it was extended by the Jews. For instance, El Shaddai. Mm. See that? God Almighty, emphasizing his power. Now, the most amazing thing about God in the Bible is that it occurs, believe it or not, more often as plural than singular, even when applied to our God. In other words, it is God's instead of God. In the beginning, God's created. Can you believe that? That's in Hebrew. And God's said, let there be light. And God's said, let us make man in our own image. Do you believe in God's? That actually is our question and should be our question to people if we are going to be scripturally accurate. So that means that the one true God is more than one person. In fact, he is three persons in one, but we'll deal with that more in the letter T. Let's get back to the name. Okay, what is God's name? God's name was given to him by himself. And God mentioned his name for the very first time in Exodus chapter 3. God says to Moses, I am who I am. In other words, whenever you hear this name, I want you to think of me and no one else. When you hear this name, I want you to understand what I am like. So he gave himself that name, I am, what I am. And then he told them to hallow it, to make it holy, give it to no one else. It's a holy name, it belongs to me. See, if you went up to a Hindu and asked, do you believe in God? You know what he would say? He would say, which one? And then you would have to give the name of that God. Well. Believe it or not, this was the situation in the world when God revealed his name to Moses. Pharaoh, 
and the people of Egypt believed in many gods with many names. And the Lord had just informed Moses that he was to return to Egypt and to Pharaoh and deliver some news for him. And Moses said, whom shall I say sent me? And the Lord said, tell them I am has sent you. So when God gave Moses his name, it was written just like this. Why? This is in English, obviously, transliterated. Y-H-W-H. Okay? You see the little vowels there? They weren't there. In the Hebrew language, there are not vowels written. Okay? They are understood. Okay? Now, transliterated, it would be J-H-V-H. Then we say Jehovah. Now, no one really actually knows how to say Y-H-W-H. What we have done is we've come along and we've put in the vowel A there and E there, and we say Yahweh is what we say, and that's what I will say. But the missing vowels between these consonants is normal in Hebrew, okay? So, sorry, real quick, you, you said something really interesting. You said, if he is, I am, that's what they always refer to. But if you ask somebody else, do they know the, the great I am? Who the great I am, other religions? Well, like I said, if, if you were to ask a Hindu if you believed in God, they would say, because they believe in many gods, they would say, you know, which yeah. God are you referring to, okay? So in terms of us, getting an answer from them, the great I am, you know, the, 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 the answers are going to be various throughout the whole entire word, world. But what I'm saying is that we know in the Bible the one true God's name is I am or Yahweh. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. Okay. So the solution, how to pronounce this, well, what do we do? Well, we need to make for the nearest Jew who knows ancient Hebrew and ask him. The problem is for centuries Jews never pronounced it. So to know how to pronounce it is actually lost. Now, how in the world do we hallow a name that we don't even know how to say? Why did the Jews stop pronouncing his name? Well, because of commandment number three. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. In other words, never ever use the name of the Lord in a wrong way. So you know what the Jews thought? Hmm, the safest way to not break commandment number three is just never say it. That's what happened, okay? So we can only go by what those four letters mean, not necessarily how they're pronounced. Yahweh means I am who I am. It also means I am what I am, and it also means I will be what I will be. In other words, it carries all three tenses. Now I have a question that's interesting what you said, not to use God's name, and because a lot of people, myself included, when something I'm like, Jesus Christ, or mm -hmm. I said, holy, mm -hmm. S-H-I-T, mm -hmm. so we shouldn't say that. No, no, no. I should like to watch my name. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, we, we shouldn't, okay? To make something holy is yeah. very sacred. Yeah. We have to be very careful with how we use God and his name and, and, and how we treat things. There, a lot of people in this world, just as a side note, they think that there's two categories, and a lot of Christians walk around. There's either the sacred world or the spiritual world. There's the sinful things or the sacred things, okay? But actually, there's three divisions. There's the holy, there's common, and then there's unholy, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and, and the unholy is taking holy things and making them common or unholy. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Anyways, that's a side thing. Okay, so God is saying, I am so unique in my name, you cannot compare me to anyone or anything else. You can't describe me because I'm not like you. It also tells us that he is sufficient in himself. His nature is unchangeable. He's always perfectly consistent. But in the Old Testament, God allowed, through the anointing of the Holy Spirit and upon his prophets, he kept adding a phrase to his name so that we could understand him better. It would help us understand his character. So the great I am, Yahweh, is not just Yahweh. It's, for instance, Yahweh, Yahwa, or Jehovah, right? Mm -hmm. I am provider, or Yahweh, Rapha, mm -hmm. I am healer, mm -hmm. or Yahweh, Misa, I am your flag or your banner. Mm -hmm. When you're in the middle of a fight, I'm over you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or what about this one, Yahweh, Shalom, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I am your peace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or what about Yahweh? Sit to me. I am your righteousness. Mm -hmm. Isn't that beautiful? You see how he just filled out his name? He added something that filled out or described for us what he is. We can read in the Psalms, and the Jews love to sing it, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. But all of this is Old Testament. And we are tied as believers to Old Testament Judaism. So what in the world do we call him? Well, Jesus came to earth and called him Father. Mm -hmm. And when he taught us to pray, he said, when you pray, say, Father. Right? He didn't tell us that when you pray, say, Yahweh. He didn't say that. He said, say, Father. Now, <clears throat> this was huge for a Jew. And it's the first big change in the New Testament. The new name for God used in prayer is Father? Yes, it is. Jesus used it, and he instructed his followers to use it. And they were all Jewish, so they were brought up to address God as Adonai, or Lord. Adonai is the Hebrew word for Lord, okay? Or here was another one that they could address um, God as, is Hashem, is the name. Hashem, the name. Jews would never, ever, ever have dared to call God Abba. Abba. To do that would be impertinent. That would be to break commandment number three. Jews didn't dare say or even write his name, much less call him Abba. In fact, today, if you get a Jewish news newspaper and they, they talk about God, it would be G D. They won't even put the O in there. But Jesus came and said, the first thing that you need to understand about God and his name is what it means. It's not about whether you speak it. It's what it means to us. He is Father, so go ahead and say Father. And all those added phrases onto Yahweh describes a good father. And oh man, that was just shocking to the Jews. But then, oh my goodness. Jesus started to do something even more shocking than calling God Father and telling others to call him Father. Guess what Jesus did? He said of himself seven times, I am. Ooh. He used God and called himself God. And then he added descriptions about himself, just like descriptions had been added in the Old Testament. I am I am the bread of heaven. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. And every time Jesus said this, within hearing distance of the Jewish leaders, they immediately tried to kill him. In fact, this is the reason why the Jews killed Jesus, because he called himself Yahweh. And that was blasphemy. It was breaking covenant, or uh, commandment. And this is the whole point of letter N. Because it now means that the name of God is Jesus, or Yeshua, his Hebrew name. So now when we go out into the world and we witness, it is no longer the mandate from the prophet Isaiah that was given to Israel. Israel was called to be Jehovah's Witness, or Jehovah's Witnesses. They were, that was their call in Old Testament Judaism. But now Jesus instructs us, you shall receive power to be witnesses to me, Jesus. We, on this side of the cross, are called to be witnesses of who? Jesus. Not Jehovah. Yeshua. And this is the mistake of the Jehovah's Witness today. That was Israel's call before Messiah came, to be Jehovah's witness. But we, the church, are called to be witnesses of Yeshua. And that's why you can go into your New Testament, and you can read that the apostles never preached Yahweh or Jehovah. They preached Yeshua. Jesus is who they preached. And guess what else they did? They baptized in the name of Jesus. One name covers all. So you hallow or make holy the name of God when you hallow the name Jesus. Do you see that? 
you are actually being a witness to Jehovah or to Yahweh when you speak to the world about who? Jesus. Jesus. <clears throat> that's it. That's exactly it. So that's in the name. N. All right, let's go on to O, P, and Q. Let's start with peace. It's a cynical world in this, oh, cynical word in this world. Everywhere we look today mm -hmm. on TV, we can see throughout the world, there is no peace. We can't say that we got peace from two world wars. In fact, ever since Cain killed Abel, there has been conflict. Mm -hmm. Yet in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God is called the God of peace. So the world doesn't believe in the God of peace. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, why so much bloodshed, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let's go back to the cross that was nailed above Jesus when he was on the cross. It was this. Jesus of Nazareth, King of of the Jews. That's what the sign above him said on the cross. But it was placed above him and it was written in three languages, that phrase, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. It was written in Latin and Greek and Hebrew, the three major languages of the world in that day. So let's look at the word peace in those three languages. And we're going to find that the word peace has totally different meanings. Let's start with the Latin word, the Romans. The Latin word for peace is pax, P-A-X. It's where we get our word today, pact, to make a pact or to make an agreement, right? And it's a political word that means an absence of war. That's what pact means or pax means. In other words, in the Roman world, peace meant an absence of outward conflict. This is what my grandparents and my parents were praying for during World War II. Political peace and absence of outer conflict. But our God is not that kind of God. Because Jesus came along and he told us that until the end of history, when he comes back, there will be wars and rumors of wars. All right, so we can kind of forget the Roman word of peace. That doesn't fit. It doesn't fit the narrative, right? Okay, good. Greek. Let's talk about that. The Greek word for peace is Irene. It's where we get the name Irene. If you know of anyone named Irene, it means peace. Now, to the Greeks, peace was defined as being the absence of inner conflict. So you've got the Roman world, the absence of outer conflict, and now the Greeks is the absence of inner conflict. And for them, it wasn't tied to outward things. It was tied to inward things. The Greeks believed that, well, listen, if you are free of inner conflict, if you have personal tranquility, mm -hmm. then you have peace. Mm -hmm. And what do we get with all the Eastern religions, mm -hmm. right? The yeah. yogas, the meditations, mm -hmm. what are they all after? Mm -hmm. Inner peace, peace, right? Yeah. Exactly. I want you to notice something about the two definitions in the Roman world, which represents the West, where we are, and the Eastern world by the Greeks, right? Did you notice that both of those definitions have a negative perspective? Mm -hmm. It's the absence of. The absence of outward or inward conflict. Mm -hmm. But we have to go and we have to look at the word peace in ancient Hebrew. Right in between the East and the West, right where the middle, sandwiched in between the East and the West, were God's people, the Hebrews. And his word for peace was shalom. This is a greeting you will still hear today all over Israel, or if you go down into the Jewish district in L.A. We don't use any word like that in the Western world, okay? Shalom has a totally positive meaning. It is neither the absence of outward conflict nor the absence of inner conflict. Rather, it is the presence of two things. When you say, Shalom, do you know what you're doing? You're revoking a blessing of physical health or good health to you. But you are also declaring a presence of harmony, of right relationship with other people and with God. Peace in your relationship this way and this way and good health. Do you see how positive it is? That's what Shalom is. Can you say that one more time? I'm sorry. It's a yeah. When you say shalom, you are evoking a blessing of physical health <laughs> to someone, but you are also declaring a presence of harmony, of right relationship with other people and with God. I know what if this is good and this is good. 
Listen, now, my husband and I, we raised four kids, and sometimes in our household, there was no peace. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so I would send them each away to their to their, their rooms. Go to your rooms! <laughs> right? You just had it. And what I did is I achieved Roman peace. Maybe I even achieved a little bit of Greek peace, right? When I did that. But never did I achieve shalom mm -hmm. when I was at my wit's end and mm -hmm. sent them to their room. Yeah. I had shalom when we were all together playing in the pool or enjoying a meal together when there was peace with each of us and with yeah. God. Yeah. Utterly positive. It's not a leave me alone peace. Mm. That's not what shalom is. So God is described over and over and over again as a God of peace. Don't leave me alone, kind of God, but no, I want right relationship. And guess what? You will never get the peace of God until you find the God of peace. Mm -hmm. The fact is, God never contradicts himself. God is peace. Yet what God has done in history seems to be utter chaos at first sight. But those who know the God of peace see that God is moving the whole of history towards one grand final event, the end of everything in Christ. So what God is and has within himself is peace, and he wants to give peace to people. And that's why in the New Testament, Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. In other words, God gave Jesus the Prince of Peace. And when Jesus got ready to die, he said to his friends, I'm going to leave you something. I'm not going to leave your material wealth. My peace, I leave with you. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. Let's go to John 14, 27, really quickly. words here in red. He says, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. Mm -hmm. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. Mm -hmm. So don't be troubled or afraid. Here it is. The world knows of no such kind of peace. It just doesn't. Mm -hmm. And the world, it's, super, it's a supernatural kind of thing given from heaven. And that peace that Jesus just spoke about in that, in that passage, you know what that can do? That can rule your hearts. Which therefore, when that kind of peace rules in your heart, guess what it does? It brings order. And order is going to result in quietness. God is a God of order, which is peace, who speaks with a small voice and makes you quiet in the midst of a storm. Ever since Genesis 1-3, when he said, let there be light, God has been bringing order out of chaos. And our lives, due to sin, result in chaos, right? But God comes and he brings order. Jesus comes and he gives you his peace. He speaks peace, which brings order and results in quietness. It's what I wanted when I sent the kids to their room. Mm -hmm. But see, understand with Shalom... This comes from the inside to the outside, first with myself, then with others, and with the Lord. You see that? So that's order, peace, and quiet. Okay, let's talk, let's go on to RNS, reign and sovereignty. Okay? <clears throat> in the Old Testament, in Psalms, it says the Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. And in the New Testament, in Revelations, it says, Hallelujah, the Lord God omnipotent reigns. In other words, these two scriptures prove, and they aren't the only ones, but these are just two that I chose, that both testaments of the Bible say the exact same thing. You know what that says? God is king, period. He just is. God is king. The Bible began in the throne room, and guess what? The Bible ends in the throne room of God. And in between the very beginning and the very end, there's a whole bunch of human thrones and empires that come and go. But throughout all of those human empires that come and go, 
God is always on the throne, established in the heavens. See, before Jesus ever taught that God is Father, you know what he really taught about? The kingdom. He was always talking about the kingdom, kingship, the royalty of God. This is the most important thing that the church does not understand today. That they must keep this in mind. He is a king. You don't approach a king. No one can just casually approach a king. And even if you are allowed to approach a king, you must not treat that king like he's a peer. Get this bump, God. Let's get a little chummy here, God. Uh -uh. He is king. Like we're bumping elbows or high-fiving each other with our peers. We must always have an awe and a reverence. There was an Australian who said, all me to God, all me to God. And that's just about the understanding of the church today. It's a very dangerous thing. He's not our mate, right? He is our king. It's hard to understand a king, though, and a kingdom, because the fact is, we've probably all been born and raised right here in the United States of America, and we live in a democracy where everyone is equal. That's right. But, oh my gosh, that is so not true in a kingdom where a king reigns. If we had the distinct experience to be able to go to the Middle East and live in some of the Arabian kingdoms, we would understand kingdom. Because a king reigns in those kingdoms over his subjects. And you are either a king or you are subjects. There's only one king, and he reigns. And what he says is it. So if a king wakes up one morning and says, you must die today, you're not equal. You will die. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. That is what a king is. We are subjects. There is one king, and his name is Lord. It's a powerful dominion. A king is a person who has absolute control of all that happens within his dominion. We walk around as Americans. We can't even help it. And we, you know, we get up every morning. What do I want to do today? Mm -hmm. How am I going to run my life? This is what I don't, my parents, don't tell me what I'm going to do. I, it's my life. I'm going to decide. See, when you're a subject in a kingdom, you understand clearly that the king owns you. And if he says you are to be a plumber, guess what? You are to be a plumber. Period. That's exactly what it's like. Okay? He is not a God on the phone in the sense that you can call or send him a text. He picks up and say, says, oh, what can I do for you? Yeah, will you put this right for me right away? Here's an emergency, Lord. I need to get it put right. <clears throat> Lord, this is how I feel. This is what I want you to do for me. I need you to adjust things for me. It's not, that's not the view of our relationship. You approach with reverence. Not to try and to persuade him to do your will. Rather, you come to his presence with gratitude and in awe and say, Father, right? You can call him Father. You're my king. What is your will for me today? And then you seek to do it. Know this, human reason or understanding does not find the throne of God in human experience. You will never know that God is on the throne if left to your own reason. There's, because we see too much around us, we have our own experiences, and all of those experiences draws a different conclusion. I can't see a God on a throne that's in control of all that's going on right now in our country and in the world. See, this truth is only revealed in the Bible. The book of divine revelation. And do you want to know something? Every single human being must decide whether we are going to accept human reasoning or divine revelation as authoritative. Which group will you fall into? You can't live in both. You can't have one foot in one and one foot in the other. You have to decide. Human reason will always say human responsibility is the last word. Divine revelation will say God is still on the throne. He always has been. He always will be. He is creator. He is king. He is judge. And he wants to be my father. Mm -hmm. The two are contradictory. To each person, you must choose what is true for you. All right, which brings us to the letters T and U, okay? 
Trinity and unity. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And verse 14. The last verse in that chapter and in that book, actually. One of the most wonderful, beautiful verses. It's very simple. Thir the uh, Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. <clears throat> and it says this, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. That's a Trinitarian scripture. Okay, you can keep it there so you can keep looking because I'm going to explain it. We come now to something so difficult for our minds to take in that some have actually objected to the idea of believing in the Trinity. It's a hard concept. The idea that God is really three persons and yet at the same time one God. It's something that our little mathematical minds just cannot comprehend. Tell people that three is one and one is three. It's beyond them. It makes no sense. It's beyond me. It's beyond you. And that is why we have different organizations like Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, Christian Science. They cannot deal with the Trinity. And that is exactly why they're, they're where they are. Okay? But we must go to the Bible to try and understand the Trinity and its unity. Not so that we can argue, but so that we can wake up every morning knowing personally the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, the first glance at the Bible seems to be, at first sight, a divided book. In the Old Testament and the New Testament as well, there seems to be like, wait, no, this isn't consistent. You see, the Old Testament focuses and emphasizes its teaching on the unity of God. The unity of God, the unity of God. God is one. The Jews' favorite scripture, even to this day, is, Hear, O Israel, for the Lord thy God, he is one. And that's in the Old Testament, and it's true. The New Testament, though, comes along and teaches that God is three. In the Old Testament, we don't realize the relief it was for people in those days when they only needed to believe in one God. It was a world where they believed in many gods. Polytheism was rife from Egypt and Canaan, even cultured Greek, uh, Greece and its mythology. And even today, still, in many parts of the world, people struggle with anxieties and fears caused by their belief in many gods. Missionaries will confirm what I'm saying to you. They will confirm this. There's a God who looks over your health. There's another God that looks over your home. There's another God for your job. There's another God for your travel. There's another God for your money. There's another God for the weather, and so on and so on. And you had to try and keep all these different gods happy. Imagine what your prayer life would be like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's difficult enough with one God, but imagine that many. And this is what missionaries still today deal with. So in the midst of keeping all of these gods happy, happy, one day you might get up and, oh no, you might have failed to pray to one of those gods, and that will cause you damage. Mm -hmm. So therefore, invariably, with all the altars and the idols, you always had one altar and labeled it to an unknown god. So that whoever you missed praying to that day, you could say, well, actually, I did mention you. Because, you see what I'm saying? I covered, I had insurance on that one, right? <laughs> then there are some people in parts of the world who believe, like I said, many gods, but then there are some that believe in just two gods, and this is also a very prevalent, prevalent belief. It's a religion from ancient Persia called Zoroastrianism, whose founder was Zoroaster. And he taught that there are two gods. There's one good, and there's one bad, and they are both equal in strength. And every single day, they struggle with each other. And so every day, you get to wake up and you get to wonder, who will win today? <laughs> and so you're tossed back and forth between these two. 
into that world, the Jews came with this glorious message. Hero Israel, the Lord thy God, he is one. What a relief. That was great news for the world. The Jews today still regard it as the treasure of the world. A belief in one God. Do you realize what they introduced to the world? Monotheism. Over polytheism. They did it. No one else did. And this runs throughout the Old Testament. Yet do you realize that it is not enough to believe in one God? That won't save you. It is not in itself sufficient. Many people today out here say, well, you know, I believe in God. I'm not an atheist. They pick up that much from the Christian faith, but more is needed. There are other religions that believe in one God. Islam, for instance, they believe in one God. By the way, that's the only major religion in the world that started after Christianity. What about this one? In the New Testament, in the book of James, it says, you believe God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe that and tremble. So we've got even demons who believe in one God. Do you see what I'm saying? It's not enough to believe in one God. So we can see the New Testament truly does restate what the Old Testament said. That God is one. But as we read the gospel, there's this big question that starts arising. Uh, who is Yeshua? What is he? Well, yes, he is a man. He's a remarkable man, though. What kind of man could possibly get the wind and the waves to obey him? And you know what? Jesus' enemies saw the truth way before his friends saw the truth. In fact, it was the demons that were the very first to acknowledge who Jesus was. And after the demons recognized who he was, the next people that recognized him were the leaders of the Jewish people. They saw it and revealed it by accusing him of blasphemy when he called himself I am. But it wasn't until after the resurrection that one of his disciples, in fact, the greatest skeptic out of those 12, said, my Lord and my God. He called a man that. Again, that's huge for a Jew. Now, here's the problem. This is a big problem. We now have two persons that have been mentioned, and in order to distinguish them, we must give them different names. If Jesus, Yeshua, was God, uh, then there must be another, because Jesus was always praying to another. Mm -hmm. oh. So we know about God the Father, and God the Son, but then right before Jesus left the disciples, he said, now there's going to be a third person coming. Mm -hmm. When I return back to the Father, I will pray, and he will send another to look after you. And you know what? When we get to the book of Acts, you've got the third divine person. He's like the Son in that he teaches and he comforts. <clears throat> But you know what? He bears a different name. And we've got an astonishing truth at this point. That God is three. So Acts tells us that God is three. And the rest of the New Testament epistles tells us that God is three. And if that were the whole picture, it would be simple. You either choose to believe in the Old Testament God, one, or choose to believe in the New Testament God, three. So do we choose between the two? Or could it be that both are right and both are true? And yes, the answer is both are right and both are true. Does the Old Testament ever, ever, ever say that God is more than one? Yes, it does. Remember when we studied the letter N at the beginning about God's? <laughs> Gods, remember that? Why does it say in Genesis 1, let us make man in our image? There it is. It's hidden right there. So you see, the unity of God is kind of hidden, or uh, the unity of God is hidden in the Old Testament, and the New Testament restates that unity when it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, he is one. Right? And with that restatement, of Israel, the Lord thy God, he is one, 
commandment is also the stated what we are to do with that God. We are to love the Lord God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But then Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 28, I want you to go out into the world and I want you to baptize people into Hashem. Hashem is the name. I want you to baptize people into the name. The name of who? The name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. Now, is Father a name? It's not. Father is a title. I am a daughter. I am a mother. I am an aunt. I am a sister-in-law. I am a granddaughter. You see what I'm saying? Those are all titles, but that's not who I am. Okay? So, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are titles. So, we've got to understand and figure out then... When the apostles said, baptize all believers into the name, what is the name of the Father? What is the name of the Son and so forth and the Holy Spirit? Okay? Now let's really, I'm going to get into this in just a second. But the unity is the night before Jesus went to the cross, he prayed the most beautiful prayer. He prayed for all believers to be united. And he said this to God. He said, even as we are one. That's the sort of unity that Jesus had with his father. Unity of thought, unity of words. They thought alike. They said the same thing. Unity of deeds. Now, that doesn't mean they did identical things. But what one did was complementary to the other. It's a unity of nature that is seen in the physical and the unseen in the spiritual. So you've got to understand this whole idea of trinity and unity. In the Old Testament, unity is emphasized. But it doesn't exclude his trinity. And the New Testament emphasizes the trinity, but it doesn't exclude the unity. You put it together, and you're just lost in the wonder and the love and praise. And I just have to say, God, you are three, and God, you are one. I can't explain it, but I know it's true. That is my faith, and I bind myself to the strong name of the trinity. So what is the name of the trinity? Well, we know that we've got Father... Son, and Holy Spirit. We know that the Father, before he was known as Father, revealed his name as Yahweh. We'll just say it was Yahweh, which the Jews refer to as Lord, which he is. He is established king on his throne, is he not? Okay. And Lord, what about the Son? He sent his Son, whose name is Yeshua, and we call that name, translated, Jesus, right? What about the Holy Spirit? Hamashiach. Ha, H-A is the word the in Hebrew. Ha, ha, Hashem is the name. Hamashiach, the Holy Spirit. This is really the Messiah. Mashiach is Messiah. And what does Messiah translate to in English? Christ, meaning the anointed one with power. So really, the name in which we are baptized into is Yahweh Yeshua HaMashiach. In English, Lord Jesus Christ. That's the name of the Godhead. Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. And what makes that so different from every other religion and such a blessing, rather than causing a division amongst believers? Check this out. Here is a picture of us. I have a God above me. I have a God who walks beside me, right? And I have God inside me. Above, beside, inside. That covers all three dimensions of my being that need help. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. And that's what that does. And that's why I can just say, thank you, Lord. I can get caught up in praise and worship. And I can be talking to the Father, I can be talking to the Son, and I can be talking to the Holy Spirit. And only one can come to an understanding of that through experience, as we just read in that 2 Corinthians 13, 14. So how is it experienced? Well, you know, for an unbeliever, it comes, there's a realization that one day, God the Son, Jesus, left heaven to come and find us and to save us. And all of a sudden, we 
come to this grace, this free gift of the understanding of what this member of the Trinity did for us. That's the first experience for an unbeliever. And after that experience, that person starts saying, whoa, this is so heavy. I can't believe that God died on the cross for me. I mean, who thought of all that? Who planned it? And they begin to discover it was the love of God. Mm. The Father who did that. And they go, whoa, that's amazing. And then all of a sudden they start coming out from their house and they're around other believers and they discover that there's other people who have found the grace of Jesus and the love of God. And you know what that person realizes? They've been born into, born again into a brand new family. And that you start meeting your new family an amazing connection of thought and will and emotion and deeds are all common. Do we all do the identical thing? No. What we do is all complement each other. But our thoughts are unity, right? Mm -hmm. And, 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 and what we're achieving or going forward, seeking God's will, is all in unity and a sense of closeness that, you know what, supersedes the bloodline of families yeah. begins to happen in this new family that you've been born into. And God, the Holy Spirit, becomes real to you. Let's see what Paul said again. Read that verse again. Look at that. May the grace, that's a gift, of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You'll never totally, exactly be able to understand the Trinity on this side of death, but you can take it in faith and say, all I know is my experience trumps your argument. Right? It's a personal experience. Mm -hmm. You can't believe you found three persons, and these three persons are so united, you can hardly tell them apart. Sometimes you hardly know who you're praying to. You're just caught up in the Trinity, and you can now say, oh, he, mm -hmm. he is mine, and I am his. Mm -hmm. Now, I do want to say one final word about the Trinity, and this is very important. He, God, is three persons, okay? He is not one person. He is three persons, but he is one person. God. He is not three gods. He is one God who is three persons. Now, what do they know about each other and themselves? What do they know? Each one has his own center of consciousness, knowing that he is not the other two. Okay? Um, they can converse with each other and obviously do. But they share one nature. They share one thought or thinking and feeling and acting and reacting in the same way. They work together in such perfect cooperation for our creation and redemption, but each makes his own contributions. Even Satan cannot divide them. Let me give you a quick example. Who out of these three, two, or out of these three, I'm sorry, who out of these three went to the cross? Jesus. Right. The Father didn't go to the cross. Right. The Holy Spirit didn't go. It was Jesus who went to the cross. Who was it who said, go to the cross and stay there? The Father. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. It was complementary. It was all part of the plan. So there was unity in the plan and the, um, the carrying out of that plan. Okay? All right. Are there any questions on Trinity and unity? I know if you think about it long enough, you can have a headache. You know <laughs> what I'm saying. Are there any unanswered? That, okay. All right, good. Now, let's go on to vengeance and wrath. To really have a greater understanding of V and W, I would suggest this week, a couple times throughout the week, read Romans chapter 1. Oh, praise the Lord. It's the beginning of the gospel. And the gospel is what? It is. The what? Good news. Oh, it's good news. And Romans 1 is the gospel, which means Romans 1 is good news. And guess what? It's full of God's wrath. Mm. You see, the truth of the vengeance and wrath of God is more than one dim dimension. Let's go to Romans 12, 19, really quick. And it says, this is Paul writing, it says, Dear friends, never take revenge. 
leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will keep burning coals of shame on your head. Don't let evil come for you, but come for evil by good. Okay, so let's let's parse this, okay? Never take revenge. Leave it to the righteous anger of God. Scripture says, I will take revenge. Get this, God said this. Listen, you've got somebody who's done you really dirty. God says about that, I will pay them back. Think about that. I will pay them back. Hmm. It's a practical outcome of studying this aspect of the character of God. We are told to never take personal revenge on anyone for whatever they do to you. Because we're going to let who pay them back? God. That's right. And God does repay. But there's a deeper lesson. The truth of Romans 12, 19 not only involves our relationship with others, but we must find a way of escape ourselves from that vengeance and that wrath. Did you know that John the Baptist came along and you know what he told the Jews, the chosen people of God? You know what he said? He said, flee from God's coming wrath. He said that to the people of God. You see, there are many difficulties today in the believer's life because this truth is not being taught and understood properly. And it results in believers who don't have a big enough gratitude to God for all that he has saved them from. And when you don't have a big enough gratitude for which you've been saved, then you don't love much because you don't realize how much you've been forgiven. And the words vengeance and wrath are needed to understand this. And those two words, uh, they're out of style. They're not politically correct. In fact, did you know that vengeance and wrath, they're seen as intolerant words, right? Intolerant. Let's take that word, intolerant. <clears throat> did you realize that intolerant is a very, very holy word? Most people don't think of intolerant. What is the opposite of intolerant? Tolerant, exactly. And the, and the church has gotten turned upside down thinking we're called to be tolerant. Right. Mm -hmm. Listen, tolerant means to put up with less than the standard. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. Is God now lowering his standards? No. No, so God is what? Intolerant. That's right. Mm -hmm. That is exactly right. So let's start with vengeance or retribution. The big question, is vengeance or retribution right or wrong? What about wrath? Are they wrong in and of themselves? Well, I believe that vengeance and wrath in human beings are usually wrong. Why? Because we are quite incapable of, of either and still maintain self-control. You see, if we take revenge, we lose our temper. <clears throat> And therefore, the Bible says to never avenge yourselves. We're not safe to do so. And that's a very strong command. The Bible says we should never go to bed with wrath in our heart, nor let the sun go down in your anger, because you'll have a bad night. Why? Because you'll have a bad conscience. The Bible also says that the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. But guess what? The Bible also says God's wrath works righteousness. <sighs> wow. Therefore... We're told, of course, forgive, turn the other cheek, and so forth in our personal relationships. But because vengeance and wrath are wrong in a human being does not mean that they are wrong in a holy being. Mm. That's what the Bible is telling us. There's only one in the universe who is safe enough to exercise either, and that is the holy God. And that's why we leave vengeance and wrath to him. And that's why the word says, if an enemy is hungry, thirsty, go ahead and feed him. Because guess what? God is going to repay to him what he's done to you. Something we're told not to do that God actually does, which is extraordinary. This is the one thing in which we are not to be like God. Our attitude to our enemy must not be the attitude of God to our enemy. He can be trusted to take vengeance. He can, and guess what? He will. And all this because God is in perfect control of his vengeance and wrath. Therefore, 
He will be perfectly fair and perfectly just. Okay, think about it. When we're really angry, somebody has done something unfair to us, like our boss. We usually take it out on someone else, right? We're terribly angry, frustrated, hurt. There's wrath in our heart. Who gets the brunt of it? The spouse. When we get home, right? Is that fair? No. Is it just? See, our vengeance goes further than what we received. God's vengeance never gets out of control like ours does. But many believers feel such disappointment when they hear about a God of vengeance. <gasps> that's not a Christian God. That's what, we, that's what the church has turned into today. Would that also be a way of them saying, God punished me because I did this, God punished me? Well, that's a... I don't... Do you hear many saying that today? I do, depending on... God. Which circles you're in. God does chasten his people. Right. We correct our children. I spanked my children. There is a difference between a chastening and a discipline and vengeance and wrath. There is a difference. And that's and so for those kind of believers that are a part of the kingdom of God, there is a... Um, it says that if you're not disciplined by God, you're a bastard. The scripture says that, right? So... A God who loves his children will discipline them, okay? And we'll get into that more, but I'm talking about revenge right now, okay? Um, there's a man, let me tell you about this man. He lived in the second century. His name was Marcion, and he said just what I said a minute ago. That's not a Christian God. He said that centuries ago. That's the God of the Old Testament who is full of vengeance and wrath. So you know what he did, this Marcion guy? Marcionianism is what it was called. Oh, man, it caused a major problem in Christianity in the early church. And we have a new um, resurgent of Marcionianism today, especially here in the United States, okay? What he did is he cut out the Old Testament. Don't read the Old Testament. Only read the New Testament. That's what he told people. And he had a lot of impact as a leader. But then you know what he did? He started studying the New Testament more and more, and he said, jeez, took out his scissors and he says, no, we got to cut out the whole book of um, Revelations because the vengeance and wrath of God is in Revelation. Then he kept studying the New Testament oh, and the loving book of God, uh, John's Gospel. we got to cut parts out of that too. And you know what? When he was done, there was very, very, very little of the Bible that was actually left. Why do we react in the same way when we hear about the truths of God's vengeance and God's wrath. Well, one reason is we don't hear it preached anymore. We're only telling one side of God's character. There's always two sides to every coin, is there not? Right. But it may be due to the, the, the problem with having a problem with this. It may be due to our human idea of wrath, but I also, in, greater, in a greater way, think that it's due to our incorrect human idea of love. We have a wrong idea of love. And our idea of love in this country allows for no room for vengeance and wrath because our love is all sentimental, which is not truth. We have an inadequate conception of true love, of holy love. And that's why I try to put the word holy in front of love when teaching about God's love. So you don't get the idea that God's love is just some magnified uh, human form of love. Because that's what most people today, as believers, I'm not talking about unbelievers, that's what most believers are walking around with today. That God just loves in a human way much better than us humans can love. No, that's not it at all. Far from it. But the final test of all our ideas of God is whether Jesus was like this. And I have found everything in the Old Testament is compatible with Jesus in the New Testament. And that's why I accept it. In other words, I would not believe that God was a God of vengeance and wrath unless Jesus was also a person like that. And if you go through the parables of the gospel and read about what Jesus said about the kingdom of God, oh my goodness, you will see that Jesus was saying the same thing that God was saying. Let's, um, I'm going to ask you to read this because I've got, a, uh, let's see, yeah. Well, you know what? Wait a minute. Uh, Mm, yeah. Read Matthew chapter 22, 1 through 14 this week. If you get a chance, I'm not going to check on you. That was it again, Matthew 22. Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. Read that parable. I'll give you a quick synopsis. The king was angry. 
he sent his troops to destroy the people in the city. And, and Jesus was teaching that the king is he, Jesus. And the people in the city are those that belong to him. Do you guys know the verse John 3, 16? Mm -hmm. Where, how does it start? For God so loved the world. Yeah, you got it. Does anyone know John 3, 36? Yes. Off hand? Uh -huh. Anyone who believes in the Son has eternal life, but anyone who refuses to obey him, the wrath of God remains. Do that again. John 3.16. For God so will, 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 will love the world and he gave his only begotten son that oh, the love, the love of God, all they have to do is believe in him. I believe in you. I believe in him. Go right down a few verses down and notice that it says anyone who believes in the son has eternal life, but anyone who refuses to obey him, the wrath of God remains on him. Thus, we're right back to John the Baptist. Flee the wrath of God. What are you going to do to escape the wrath of God? Jesus' actions, did he show wrath? Listen, Jesus wasn't angry very often, but when he was, man, was he angry. There's five recorded um, occasions in the gospel. I'll only talk about two. There was a man with a withered hand. Jesus healed that withered hand on the Sabbath. And the leaders of Judaism looked, were so mad at Jesus for healing that man on the Sabbath. He was doing good. And it says that Jesus looked on them with anger. Or what about one day Jesus went into the temple, and you know what? He took a whip. There were animals in there, and it looked like a, a Turkish bazaar is what it looked like in there. And Jesus took a whip to who? The animals to get them out of there? To the men. See, you know what they were doing, those Jews? They were in what was called the court of the Gentiles. Gentiles were not allowed to go into certain parts of the temple. But God says, my house is a house of prayer for all nations. So I want you to make sure, Solomon, when you rebuild the temple and when it was rebuilt, the same thing happened. There's a place for Gentiles to come who are God-fearers and want to pray to me. And that's where they were conducting all of this business. It was so loud and it was so noisy and it made Jesus so mad. He goes in with a whip and says, get out. This is my father's house and it is a place for prayer. Nobody can pray in this atmosphere whipped him out, his own brothers, Jews. So what in the world makes God angry? Why does his wrath come on men? Well, according to the New Testament, there are two things that makes God angry, immorality and idolatry. Those who treat themselves and fellow human beings in a wrong way and those who treat God in a wrong way. Scriptures calls us to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. So whenever we do something that worships a creature or a created item, Rather than the creator, well, that's idolatry. What about immorality? Romans 1 says it's as simple as gossip. A lot of people just think immorality has to do with sex. No. Wrong behavior toward others. Because you're breaking your love for your neighbor by gossiping about them. Or whatever. And we're to love our neighbors, right? Who's our neighbor? Everyone. So how does God show that he's angry? In your personal relationships and your friends or with your spouses or whatever, you get to know your spouse or your friends so well and you know what ticks them off, mm -hmm. correct? Well, you get to know God enough and you will get to understand mm -hmm. what ticks him off. Mm -hmm. The Bible distinguishes how God shows his anger today and how he will show his anger one day. Right now there's a simmering anger. One day there's going to be a boiling over of anger, totally boiling over. I really encourage you to read Romans chapter 1 this week. But let me just say this, okay? Let me give you the synopsis. And I think you will see the United States of America right now in Romans chapter 1. Basically, Romans chapter 1 says, when men give God up, God gives men up. Notice the order. I didn't say God gives men up, so therefore men give God up. No, 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 no. When um, um, men give God up, then God gives them up. How does he give them up? How does that actually work? What does that look like in a society? He strives for such a long time with them, saying, I'm trying to be your God of your nation. I'm trying as best I can. And man says, no, we don't want you. We're going to kick you out of every aspect of our society. And finally, God says, 
So what does he do? Well, he starts speaking to men through their conscience. Mm -hmm. He starts holding them back. Their conscience becomes sear. Mm -hmm. And he says, fine, do whatever you want. If you don't want me to help you to have a good life, then I'll let you live the kind of life that you believe that you want. But it's going to show you what kind of person you are. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the restraints off. I'm going to remove the brakes that I have applied in your life. I'm going to remove the voice of conscience. Go ahead. Do whatever you wish. And what is the result? Romans tells you. Your mind is darkened. God let that happen. Because they felt they could think without them. Their bodies become perverted. All relationships in society go wrong. Do you not? This is it. That is what's happening. Right Isn't this amazing? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then God says, I remove the inward restraints. Go ahead. But you know what? I've, I've stopped restraining you inwardly because I am, I am long-suffering. I will now restrain you outwardly. So go ahead and read Romans 13, too. And the police are described in the Bible as God's instruments of his wrath in order to restrain evildoers, right? But instead of police, then becoming the friend of the public, all of a sudden now they become an enemy of the public. Does this sound familiar? Mm -hmm. And this is totally relevant to what police officers are feeling today. Yeah. See, God says, I might remove the inward restraints, but I'm still going to control you from the outside. And you're going to see what happens when you shove me out of your nation. For me, I'm 56 years old, born in 1964. I was able to be born into a nation where we saw God being welcomed in this nation, mm -hmm. and I've seen the transformation. My grandchildren, my husband and I were talking about it last night, my children know the difference, my grandchildren don't know the difference. Wow. It's so sad. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, let me say this. Uh, you look amazing, by the way. <laughs> huh? You look amazing, oh. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> now, are we aware that God is angry with our nation? Yes. Does the world realize it? They have no idea that God is. How You know, as Christians, we just go, can't you see? Can't you get it? They don't understand it. But I promise you something. There's a day coming when the world will realize that God is angry. And it's connected to his second visit back to earth. And when they see him on that day, it will be a face that is identical to the one when Jesus took a whip to the Jewish money changers in the temple. One day, God is going to burst upon this scene of the world, and it's described vividly in the book of Revelations. There's seals and trumpets and bowls of breath. There's so much death. Uh, but then it describes the way those that are left alive, which are a few, they still refuse to worship God. In fact, they, 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 um, they scorn him and they curse him. They refuse to denounce demon worship, to change their mind and their attitude about all their immorality and all their idolatry. And the bowls of God's wrath are emptied upon the earth. And all sorts of things happen to creation around us and people and all sorts of things. Guess what? Everyone that day will know that God is angry. Yeah. There will be no question. It's bad news. <gasps> but then the sunshine comes out because God's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And there it is. It's all good. It's going to be beautiful. You see, the gospel is always bad news before good news. That's why the gospel is not working today in this world because we're approaching the world with God loves you. Good news first. It's mm -hmm. got to be bad news before mm -hmm. good news mm -hmm. for it to make an impact. That's God's way. No other way will work. Now, how can I prove all of this about God's anger? <clears throat> if I can't explain it in this way that I just have, I could go through all the stories of the Old Testament, like Noah, Sodom, Gomorrah, Nineveh, Tyre, all of this kind of stuff that proves the wrath of God. But there's one proof that will bring the amazing proof of the wrath of God and his mercy. And it's a place where you will find a way out of all of this, an escape from all of his wrath. A way that will prepare you for this terrible day of his coming. And it's the cross of Jesus Christ. If someone says, oh, prove to me that God is angry, all I have to say is, why would God do what he did to his son Jesus? It wasn't just a physical death. It was the wrath of God, the anger of God, the vengeance, and the wrath of God against all sin focused right now on Jesus. Why should God be angry with the only perfect holy life ever lived? He wasn't angry with that life. But herein lies the meaning of the cross. God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin. So you know what Jesus did on that cross? 
he drew down all of God's wrath and all of God's vengeance right down on himself. And he died saying, my God, my God, why in the world have you of all people rejected me? And so Paul says in Romans, being now justified, which is a fancy theological word for being now declared innocent because of Jesus' blood. We shall be saved from that wrath of God through Jesus. That's why the wrath of God was directed all upon Christ so that we don't have to face it. That's the gospel. It's not the love of God. It's a way to escape the wrath of God. We have been saved from God's wrath and God's vengeance by the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. I can't put it more simply than that. All the anger, all the vengeance, all the wrath that, listen, I myself deserve based on the commandments that I have broken, Jesus took for me. Nothing could be simpler. And when you believe that, then you can look forward with the peace of God and the order of God and the quiet of God right through that day that's coming, the wrath of God, and no, it won't touch me. Isn't that incredible? Right into a new heaven and a new earth, which will be totally good, and so will you. Amen? Amen? Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Which brings us then, phew, going to make it, <laughs> right, to X, Y, and Z. Okay? All right, X. I hope I can explain this well. I'm going to need my okay. The Greek letter for the word Christ looks like the letter X of what we know as X. And so what happened is, is in the early church, because the New Testament was written in Greek and spoken, Greek was the main language, okay? The early church used this letter a great deal. They began to use just this letter to represent the word Christ. And that's where we came up with this Xmas. That's where Xmas came from. Yeah, it's from the Greek letter. That's why, like, you know, like when you talk about maybe your X, okay, that's a negative a reference to, you know, an exed out relationship. But that's not, that's why I think what meant that I would never be okay with using Xmas. But really what you're saying is you're saying Christ miss is what you're doing, okay? All right. That was in the Greek, okay? But I want to tell you something really interesting. In the Hebrew alphabet, the very last letter of the alphabet is this right here. Now that's written in ancient Hebrew. Today it doesn't look like that. Today it looks more like that. That's time today, okay? But in the ancient Hebrew, the last letter of the alphabet called Tav. Tav. Say it. Tav. 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 Okay, that's what it looked like. It looked like also kind of a sideways X, if you will. Now what in the world does Tav mean in Hebrew? Well, Tav means the sign of the covenant, which is a cross. A covenant is a pact. It's a, a not a contract. It's a special type of relationship that can't be broken. We're going to be studying about what covenant is and so forth as we continue on. Okay? So it also kind of is like an X. So do you realize that in the X, we have Christ and we have the sign of the covenant? What is the sign of the new covenant? The cross. Isn't that the sign of the new covenant? Yeah. We have them attached. Christ and the covenant are attached all in the X. You see that? And that's what we have right here. Christ died for us. And in the Acts, we have Christ and we have the cross. Now, let's go to Z. Z. It says in Isaiah, it's a very um, popular uh, passage of scripture. You know this. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness 
from that time on and forever. And that's when most people stop reading. But do you know the very next sentence of the verse? That's all, what I just declared is just all wonderful, isn't it? But how in the world is that going to happen? How does that get accomplished? I love the, that's the what, but how? And the next sentence gives us the how. The, how. the next verse says this, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The zeal of the Father in heaven will accomplish, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, etc., etc. Do you see that? Now, what in the world is zeal? I love that word. Zeal is seeing a situation that is very wrong and getting involved in doing something about it. God looked down on this world, saw that it went wrong, and he did something about it. How? What did he do? He sent his son, Jesus. So, the zeal provided the X. The zeal of the Lord, the Z, provided the X. This was the promise. The zeal of God looked down, saw the chaos, and he promised the X. So the origin of the cross is from the zeal of the Lord. But now you have to ask yourself, well, okay, the zeal provided the X, so what is the effect? Well, Jesus got up at the very, very beginning of his ministry, and he opened up the scroll, he opened it up to Isaiah, and he preached from the scroll, and he read what Isaiah had prophesied. And this is what Jesus said his first time. He said, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and this is the last thing he said, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Why is acceptable year. Jesus got to preach about the acceptable year of the Lord. Now what in the world is the acceptable year? It is a year in which God will accept people for Jesus' sake in what he did on the cross. And we need to pray that more people will come to know Jesus, looking at him on the cross and saying, oh, that man was God himself dying for me. Oh, my goodness. There's a way to fully God's coming down. You see, 1968 was the acceptable year of the Lord for Nanette David. The year when God's zeal in sending Jesus to be born and to die, penetrated my heart. And it was in that year that the Lord accepted me for Jesus' sake. And each one of you in here, as a believer, can say it was in this year that was the acceptable year of the Lord for me. That was the effect of the zeal sending the X. It was when you accepted that year, and that year, and that year, and that year, and that year. You see that? Yeah. And that's what it is. How long will that time last? Well, it's only for a time. The acceptable year of the Lord only happens from the cross of Jesus until what? Jesus' return. And that grace period of people being accepted for Jesus' sake will be over. It is that day that the wrath of God comes. There is a day of wrath coming. You guys all cook. You know what it's like to have something on the stove and it's simmering, right? And you go, okay, perfect, it's simmering. And all of a sudden you hear your, right? What do you hear? <laughs> and you're like, what in the stove? Oh my gosh, I just cleaned the stove. Right? <laughs> and it's, it's boiling over. 
Right now we are living in God's simmering anger. There's a day when it's going to what? It's going to boil over. Right now the world doesn't really realize that his anger is simmering. But guess what? On the day it boils over, there will be no question. And it will be a lot of this. And yet people will be so hardened and their conscience will have become so hard and yeah. seared because he took the restraints off yeah. that they will curse God and want to die. Wow. Yeah. Instead of saying, oh, you're great, you are bigger than me. Yeah. Can you imagine that? How stubborn. Isn't it amazing? Mm -hmm. That is the heart of man. Mm -hmm. That is the heart of man. And if God has touched your heart, which he has because you are here, and you're with him, it is because he loved you first. Yeah. Isn't mm -hmm. that amazing? Let's pray. Oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord. 26 letters is not nearly enough to understand you, Lord. We've just tried a little bit to try to get and understand a, your character, each side of it, Lord, all parts of you. Lord, we know that you are so much bigger than what our minds can even grasp. But thank you in your mercy that you understood we could not even begin to comprehend you and so you gave Jesus to us so that we could understand you. Lord, may we very cautiously with great reverence, Lord, with the fear of God, may we keep in our mind the whole character of God and that you are the king, even though we may call you Father. And Lord, that we might serve you doing your will for our life in fear and trembling and in that is the safest place where your love cares for us. Lord, I pray for each person here as they go back to work today or tomorrow to continue the rest of the week. Keep them, Lord Jesus. Speak to them, Holy Spirit. And may the fellowship of the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the love of God, and the grace of Jesus be with us all. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, guys, next week we're on to the next character, and that is man. Okay? Oh, and, and I'll have pencils, but we definitely have drawing to do 